Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Randy Bell. I am the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council, which is a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today to uh, moderate this panel on investing in the environment, driving positive returns and change. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, what I really like about this panel topic is that in the title, it puts the positive returns before the change. This emphasizes emphasizes, I think, that the, the world is more likely to see the change uh, that we need if people can make money in the process. So uh, much of the conversation about the environment and climate change is about the, the cost to transform our current ways of doing business to a cleaner future. But if those new ways of doing business are actually more lucrative, it seems a whole lot easier, to, uh, a whole lot of easier of a pill to swallow. So uh, to discuss this proposition, we have with us four fantastic panelists today. Uh, down at the end, we have uh, Marina and Antonopoulou, and this is her very first time on a panel stage, so uh, well, you're going to do a great job. Um, uh, next to Marina, we have Ibrahim Al uh, Husseini, who uh, came in from sunny California. Uh, in from smoky Australia, we have Cameron Brownjohn. And finally, from uh, gloomy London, uh, Jim Toddy. Um, why don't we go uh, just very briefly, because we only have uh, 28 minutes and 25 seconds left, very briefly down, starting at Marina, and just say a little bit about what you each do. Thank you, Randy. So I work for Emirates Nature, WWF. Uh, we are a leading nonprofit environmental organization based here in the United Arab Emirates. We're also affiliated with the Worldwide Fund for Nature, which is a global uh, NGO. Um, we, our goal is basically to conserve the, the natural environment here of the UAE, but also work on climate change solutions. And to achieve that, we're working together with the government authorities as well as the business sector, various uh, partnerships uh, um, that we're implementing across the board, across our projects, as well as local communities. My focus is marine conservation, so I can talk a little bit more later. Thank you. Great, thank you. Brahim Al Husseini, uh, managing partner, Full Cycle Fund. We're a sustainable infrastructure fund that um, focuses on a nexus uh, in the climate space where we can get the highest return on capital as well as getting the highest return on carbon and we aim to be the biggest lever in the private sector for combating the climate crisis. Cameron Brown, John. Uh, Federation is a Asia-Pacific private capital firm. We have a, a renewable energy team, we have a real estate team, and we have a private equity team. I'm the chief uh, executive officer. I'm Jim Totti from Earth Capital. Um, I've been investing in impact investing in private equity for 18 years now. Um, Earth Capital has been going just over 10 years, and over that period, we've managed funds across renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, agriculture, water, um, mobility, and waste. So, a, a range of um, infrastructure and technologies across the sustainable space. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, we will now get started. So, Jim, I want to start with you on uh, the premise of the panel itself, that it's possible to achieve positive returns while also driving positive environmental change. So what is your experience with this comparing environmentally positive investments uh, and their returns versus uh, more traditional uh, non-ESG investments? So I think we've seen in the last two or three years particularly an overwhelming um, wave of evidence that um, sustainability and impact investing strategies are outperforming. And five years ago, I don't think I could have made that claim. I don't think the evidence was there. But actually, whether, whether you look in the private markets where, where I invest and we're seeing um, top managers outperforming in terms of track records versus generalist benchmarks, or whether you're seeing in other asset classes, listed equities now, where guys like MSCI have put out some really detailed data-driven analysis showing um, strategies across the ESG space outperforming more generalist peer groups. And you know, at the end of the day, their argument is basically you know, you're good at impact investing. That means you're good at looking down the road ahead of you as a management team. So you're thinking ahead. You're going to be better at managing the risks that are coming ahead. And if you're better at risk management, that means your cost of capital is lower and your share price is higher. This is real analyst 101 analysis. But actually, MSCI, of course, have got the data to back it up. And we're even now seeing the green bond market, which for a long time, I think, was quite defensive. You know, honest Gov, my green bond is no worse than its, its peer group. Actually, we're seeing green bonds now pricing tighter 
than their non-green peer group. So what, what's great as a private markets investor is the whole investment food chain now, right from seed venture capital right through to the, the, the big capital markets, the tens of billions capital markets, that whole chain now is showing evidence of outperforming in ESG and impact investing. And that means the capital flows along that food chain, along that ecosystem, will significantly increase. And I think for now, that's the, that's the most exciting thing we're seeing in the capital markets, um, is that outperformance at all stages. Cameron Abraham, are you seeing the same thing in your investments? Please, go ahead. So, um, we focus on a, a specific nexus in the private equity space. So, the, you know, I run a family office. I invest primarily in impact and clean tech. So, I've seen that personally. In our fund, we focus on a nexus where the on on the infrastructure level, we get to return a minimum of a. 14% IRR on the project level, and we get to do that with a minimum of one gigaton or more of carbon abatement at full deployment. So when you're talking about those kinds of asymmetrical returns from a risk return profile, the answer is yes. From a macro perspective, I, I definitely support uh, the, the comments from both gentlemen, uh, even the, the academic research Randy is showing uh, that there is you know, non-trivial evidence of, of outperformance from, from ESG-savvy investments. Uh, so from, from our perspective, uh, we're certainly seeing that through, say, the wind farms that we're building, mm -hmm. um, but also across our private equity business. And this is uh, almost in part a return-driven um, body of evidence but also a de-risking body of evidence. Imagine making an investment in a uh, type of industry where in five years, because the world catches up to ESG topics and ESG savvy ways, it may not be financeable. So you may not be able to exit. So uh, the, uh, the valuation um, will either go to zero or will certainly suffer. And so I guess from both a, a flowers and a baseball bat kind of logic, uh, we, uh, we, we're certainly seeing it across our, our broader business. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating. Abraham, Full Cycle notes on its website that $1 trillion in investment in low-carbon infrastructure is needed annually through 2050 to meet our climate goals. Uh, is, is the model of investing that we're talking about here capable of scaling to that level of impact, or do you think we're going to need other types of interventions? So, um, first of all, our climate goals are insufficient. You know, the, uh, so this one trillion is only to keep global temperatures below two degrees Celsius, and that's a different world than we recognize today. Um, given the fact that there's something north of $78 trillion a year being invested, in, invested around the world, what's one, pers what's one trillion dollars a year going into low carbon infrastructure? You know, as my colleague here said, as the world starts waking up to this, they'll understand that with every technology inflection point, just like going from horse and buggy to car or uh, landline to mobile, transitioning from a high carbon to a low carbon economy will be a massive wealth creation engine and will pass this trillion dollars that seemingly on this panel seems like a lot per year will dwarf it over time. Yeah, yeah. In agreement over here? Both nodding? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, I want to go to Marina for a moment. Not an investor, but actually out uh, working on the front lines, seeing all the opportunities to strengthen the environment and really get stuff done. Could you tell us about the WWF, uh, WWF Sustainable Blue Economy principles? and how you're implementing them locally. And then, and then I have two questions following, following on from that. Where do you see the best opportunities for private sector investment to achieve these sustainable blue economy goals? And then how do you see the NGO community partnering with the private sector and the investment community to, to maximize this benefit? Okay, you want me to answer that? See if you can do it all <laughs> in about two sentences. All right, no problem. Um, where to start, I guess, uh, more than ever now, we know that the oceans, they're not only 
pretty, so I'm not only passionate about the oceans, but they actually have a tremendous role to play for our human well-being and economic prosperity. That's reflected in the Sustainable Development Goals and particularly the SDG 14, Life Underwater, the global leaders actually have committed to achieve. If you do follow the, the Climate COP discussions now in Madrid, you will notice that a lot of analysts are referring into this COP as the blue COP. And, and the reason why is that there's a lot of focus in the discussions around the nexus of climate change in oceans, um, the role that oceans play uh, to mitigate climate change and uh, actually help us adapt to, to climate change. So a, a very small example is that oceans absorb 30% of our carbon dioxide emissions. We have also ecosystems here in the UAE as well, mangroves, seagrass uh, habitats, that are actually not only sequestering carbon, but they can protect our coastal infrastructure and our cities from storms, events, and we know that in the light of climate change that will become a more regular phenomenon. So in this context, as we know that oceans actually have a value to play, um, we also understand that they're under continuous pressure, they're degrading uh, because of climate change and because of a different anthropogenic human uses in the marine realm. And WBF International, to, to step up, actually has launched those sustainable blue economy principles. This is a set of principles that are aligned with existing framework, uh, such as the IFC standards or equator principles, but the move, the, the take one step forward. So they want to address the complexity of the marine ecosystems, the complexity, the inherited risks that are actually uh, are there for those economic sectors that take place in the marine realm. This, uh, these principles actually have been adopted by the Un United Nations Environment Programme, the Finance Initiative, and as well as by the European Investment Bank. And the idea is to provide a framework to divert sustainable financing more linked to the marine environment. Should I pause here and then? Well, I mean that, that's that's fantastic. Now, how do we how do we get investors to be to be investing in in some of these uh, some of the well, what types of products can you invest in to help solve these challenges? This is a great question. So I think we've seen to begin with investing in nature itself. So in bringing in natural ecosystems as part of the climate change scenarios. Uh, we've seen protecting and the environment can help replenish fish stocks, um, help the tourism sector specifically. So seeing how those interlinkages can play with the, you know, the particular context here in the UAE to invest in diversification of the economy, diversifying the actually tourism sector here as well. Um, but what we actually want to see is those economic sectors to to be able to, to um, flesh out the granularity. So different sectors, like we here in the UAE, we have desalination, we have tourism, we have shipping, ports, authorities. We want to see what does this mean for them to be able to divert more sustainable practices in action. Um, so we are here as a local NGO. Um, we actually have a global reach as well. We typically have very good connection, very, very good relationships with policymakers. We work with policymakers, so we can advise in terms of what policy change is out there. Um, we have science-based background, so we know our, our uh, region quite well. So we can advise in terms of what are the environmental impacts, what are potential risks that might come from de environmental degradation as well as climate change. Um, so th these are um, potential added value that we can bring. And we also have a broad reach. So we have a regional, global reach, we have a local reach. Um, we're talking to a private sector, we're talking about local communities, youth. Um, so we have that diversity and we can facilitate that cross-sectoral dialogue. I want to turn the question around to, to Jim, Ibrahim, and Cameron. What do you see, or what could you ask from the NGO community to help make your investments easier, to make your investments, to, to, to enable you to invest more? And we can just go down the road. I, I, think, I think it's exactly that, that kind of, of feedback. I mean, we're, um, as an investor community, we're quite slow to pick up some of the new asset classes that, that you're describing. Um, you know, for us, areas like um, soil remediation or biodiversity are not, are not natural fits for the investment community. Um, but I've seen one really great example this year in terms of wild fish stocks, mm -hmm. which is um, up till now cod um, has all been uh, largely wild fished. Um, and we've actually seen uh, great advances now in the European market, in fact, in, in Norwegian market, in terms of cod farming. 
which we've not been able to do before. And suddenly, we're going to see <coughs> that as an investable asset class over the next few years. We're going to be able to farm cod in exactly the same way we farm salmon at the moment. And that's going to take a big inflow of investment dollars in terms of farming infrastructure, in terms of shipping infrastructure, and handling. So that, that's an interesting example that's come from um, a, a market pull argument about, about depleting wild fish stocks. And actually, the technology has come up with an answer. Um, and for me, that's actually one of the most interesting um, uh, sectors I've come across this year. Um, only heard about this a few months ago. Um, but we're going to see a lot of investment dollars going into that area. Jim, it sounds like you could have been on the first uh, panel just before us as well. Which I thought was a really good panel. <laughs> it, was, it was a great panel. Cameron, your thoughts? People have choice. And investors, and I suspect most people in this room, care firstly about capital preservation before you turn your mind to return. Um, so the answer to what um, an investment community might ask of, of NGOs would be to try and figure out a mechanism to make capital more secure if it is to solve a problem in that particular industry. One way we've seen that across our business has been the involvement of government. So, so government to somehow provide some form of pricing mechanism, revenue protection, rent, some form of support. Um, and then the topic becomes less around whether the business is sustainable, because government will make it sustainable, and becomes much more a topic around pricing regulatory risk, which is something that people are more familiar with doing, uh, and therefore can start to think about it through their traditional lenses. Do you, do you also think about uh, blended capital, blended finance, um, where you have some uh, different risk pools going in, so government finance is it? Uh, well, Federation does not, uh, but I'll leave it to, to others to... Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we haven't used blended capital. We're happy to use it. You know, that usually comes from uh, uh, the certain agencies. I don't know if NGOs are the right um, agencies to do that or um, entities to do that. But to answer your question, I think by COP26, a lot of the NGOs need to put pressures on all their governments to finally pass a carbon a revenue neutral carbon tax in a worldwide across all jurisdictions because the situation is dire and we need that immediately um, or else anyway what's going to happen is a lot of economies are going to suffer you know regardless so it, this is there's no more time to keep delaying this inevitable um, tax that has to get in, go into effect it's just whether the pain by COP26 is going to be big enough to implement it, or we're going to have to wait longer and longer, keep, keep kicking the can down the road. Now, you sit in the United States, so what do you think the possibility is of that happening? I think, I think if we do the right thing in, in 2020, I think the chances are going to be high. And if we don't, and Wisconsin stays red, then it's not going to be very high. So let's, let's talk now uh, about some of the specific types of investments you're making. And I want to start with, with Cameron. Now, I know you invest in wind and solar, which have the obvious environmental impact, but also social housing and education. What is the environmental angle on, on those types of investments? I guess um, maybe I'm the odd man out on this panel. Um, I don't think we're building homes for disabled people to um, help the environment. Um, or um, childcare centres in, in our education rate to, to help the environment. The ways that we're building it is not inconsistent with the rest of our business, however. So in the example of, of both of those instances, there's substantial opportunities for rooftop solar, for green building practices and sustainable building practices. And the key takeaway that, that I guess that we can show to our investors is that just because you're building things that are better for the planet, much like the seminal works and the research that we talked about earlier, um, there's no need to sacrifice returns um, because you're doing a good thing. Abraham, you have a, a very particular stance on the types of things that you're investing in, um, really not looking at 
early stage technologies, but things you can deploy now. Maybe you can talk a little about a little bit about those investments and why you're making that choice. Yeah. Um, so we have a philosophy at Full Cycle, which is that venture capital. It's too late for venture capital to solve the climate crisis. You know, the, the investment, venture investments are, take too long on the infrastructure level to reach maturity and then have to get deployed worldwide. So we're a little bit out of time for that. The analogy I, I say is when, you know, if, you're, if your backyard is on fire, you grab a fire hose and you put it out, you don't start a firm to invest in technologies that put out fires. There's, we're just out of time. So what we do is we, uh, again, sit at this nexus that's designed specially to combat the climate crisis. One of the things that we do is we pick market-ready technologies, you know, stuff that we can break ground on tomorrow. The second thing we do is we focus on something called short-lived climate pollutants, and these are the other greenhouse gases that are much more potent than CO2. And, you know, 76% of the atmosphere, or 76% 76 of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are CO2, but CO2 is a very, isn't a very potent greenhouse gas, it just lingers forever. The other gases like nitrous oxide and HFCs, which are refrigerants, and methane are hundreds to thousands of times more heat trapping than CO2, and even though they only make up 24% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they're responsible for 45% of global warming. And so we pick infrastructure technologies that address those that have a high yield, and we go back and make sure that that yield is high enough so we can attract the level of investment needed to move the needle from a scale standpoint. That's fascinating. Um, Jim, some of the, some of the uh, tech, uh, products that you're investing in, um, they have a, a, an impact now but you see opportunities for them to have even more of an impact if you can evolve that product to make it more, uh, more environmentally friendly. Maybe you could talk through how you think about evolving an investment that has a, a, a pretty good impact now to an even better impact in the future. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, we, we invest in companies that are never perfect. Um, so we look for net positive impact when we go in. Um, but there are always issues with every technology, every business you invest in. So, in Randy's question, um, I'll pick one example, which was we have a, a sanitation technology in our portfolio, which is an air flush toilet that uses about 10 to 15 percent of the water per flush um, that a normal flush toilet would use. And in most <clears throat> developed markets um, in our cities, we use perfectly good drinking water to flush the toilets, which is, is crazy when you think about it. Um, and what our technology does is, is allow a retrofit with a toilet that, that takes 80 to 85% of the, of the water bills and water consumption out of toilets use. However, this technology is still not perfect because we still use a regular porcelain um, ceramic toilet bowl. And of course, everyone knows here, the ceramics industry is still extremely fossil fuel intensive. How we fire ceramics is still using very, you know, hundreds of years old, in fact, thousands of years old um, technology. So although we have a great product with a great net positive impact, there's still a big issue in terms of how we, how we improve that supply side. There's a number of ways you might go about doing that. It might be using ceramic um, firing facilities that use sustainable process heat sources like hydrogen. But that's not there today other than on an absolutely micro scale. We've not large scale seen the global ceramics industry make that transition. Maybe we actually switch to different materials. We use composites or metals or, or plastics. But those, of course, will have to be resistant to the very aggressive alkali environment that, that regular cleaning products um, provide for, for toilets. So we haven't solved that yet. We've got a great product on its impact, but we still have a supply side issue that needs solving. But one of the things that we do, which is fundamental to how we invest, is we measure the impact of all our port through the for portfolio companies through a consistent impact measurement framework called the Earth Dividend which is a 30-point scorecard we apply consistently across all our investments. And that picks these kind of issues up. And because we also use it to give each portfolio company an annual appraisal on impact measures, we can set targets that we want our companies to improve on over a two, three-year period when we might be involved. 
So we're investing in net positive impact businesses, but we're looking to make them even better during the period of our ownership. I want to come back to the measurement question, but I want to go to Marina for a second. So you've heard about the uh, different types of investments these guys are making. If there's one thing that you've seen here in the UAE that would uh, that could help uh, the marine environment that, that might be investable, what would you encourage them to invest in? First of all, I'd say that there is a lot of um, there, we're encouraged to see the, the the effort to diversify the economy. Uh, here in the UE, we're very encouraged to see the Sustainable Finance Declaration, which was announced uh, last year by IDGM and as well in Dubai. Um, so I would say first and foremost, the, the limited marine ecosystems that we have um, here in the UE, I would say invest in protecting them, include them in the climate change mitigation and adaptation policies and strategies and plans. Um, this can also help, again, replenishing fish stocks um, and other economic sectors. And then beyond that, I think what we could look at is, uh, for, for example, sustainable infrastructure to look at how at the coastal level, that can be uh, minimizing the environmental impacts. And we can also look at the tourism sector, for example, how the, the linkages between marine uh, ecosystems and habitats can actually benefit a diversified tourism sector here in the UAE. Fascinating. Now, on the measurement question, it's pretty easy to tell if your investment's making money or not, but uh, harder to know what type of positive uh, change it's making for the environment. Now, you have a 30-point checklist, but I'd love to hear uh, from uh, Cameron and Ibrahim how you measure uh, the, the, uh, ec uh, the uh, environmental impact of your investments. Yeah, so again, it's easy for us as well because we're measuring the carbon abatement or carbon uh, equivalent abatement of what would have been not using our technology uh, versus what happens when we use it. So it's a very simple equation. We use a, a firm out of New York called Boundless that does a full carbon life cycle analysis for us, and we don't invest in anything until we get that uh, analysis uh, to come out. And one of our technologies, we were surprised, they came up with a new measurement called um, uh, carbon return on investment. So it's a nice, interesting metric that they developed. And one of our technologies produces something like seven times as much carbon return on investment than a solar or wind farm, and it's in the waste industry. It's fantastic. Yeah. So um, the tools that uh, the renewable energy business at Federation uses to measure its do-goodness is different to the real estate business, is different to the PE business. Um, the the shape of our uh, ESG reporting however across each of those businesses do have some commonalities around environmental impacts and community impacts and, and then HR topics like diversity of gender and race and religion and so on and so forth. So, and that applies not just to the portfolio company but up and down the supply chain. Um, quite interestingly, uh, our administrator so the person that does our reporting in an IR is an outsourced agency, Apex. <laughs> Obviously, they have a stall here. So actually, Federation can be open book on our ESG impacts and reporting. You can go and take Apexes and see what they do, because they do that for us. OK, we have two minutes left. Just want to see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, uh, and if no, then uh, do I? We've answered everyone's question, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, I do have one final question then for, for uh, Marina, um, which is what do you see the role, what do you see a role for WWF and other NGOs in, in helping to drive this conversation, uh, to, uh, the corporate conversation, to shape better outcomes? What do you see, uh, how, do you, how do you get more people uh, to be making these types of investments? It's a great question. Um, I think first, firstly, we do partner, we have been partnering in the past with uh, different businesses. We have, um, this year, we launched an initial dialogue across sectors uh, with marine, maritime sectors here in the UAE to engage with them and understand what are the possibilities, the opportunities and the challenges for them to actually implement a sustainable blue economy framework within the businesses. We were really encouraged and really happy to see that the, the businesses here actually increase 
increasingly understand their interdependencies with the healthy marine environment. They understand the cross-sector potentially interdependencies, so one sector, one sector in the oceans might affect another sector, actually. Pollution might affect the salination, for example, or tourism operations here. So it was really um, evident from the discussions we had, and they're really keen to see how the SBE model can be applied into their operations. Um, and then we're, we're happy to, to explore that model. Fantastic. So thank you all. Uh, this has been a fantastic panel. Uh, uh, good luck uh, with, uh, with all of your investments. I hope that they are equally as remunerative as they are good for the environment. Um, and thank you all for joining us today.